on behalf of ABMS, the Soil Mechanics Brazilian Association, which is affiliated to ISSMG, the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, I would like to welcome all our colleagues from the UK and from Brazil who are now connected with us in this webinar, the UK-Brazilian Mining Webinar on Dry Stacking, highlighting the geotechnical challenges in the design of these structures and the global changes in legislation. I'd like to start by recalling that the UK and Brazil have a long tradition in professional cooperation with initiatives organized and launched by the Brazilian government, by the British government, by the British Council in Brazil, by some Brazilian funding agencies such as CAPES and CNPQ, and they include both university and industry. There is actually a generation of Brazilian engineers and professionals who graduated in British universities, including myself actually, and a history of collaborative research in different areas. On, on this occasion, uh, this webinar has been jointly organized by ABMS and the British government under the leadership of Lucas Brown, the British Council in the state of Minas Gerais, who is sharing this opening session with me. His work and the work of his team was much appreciated. Uh, as for the topic chosen for, for this webinar, I could not see any other alternative more appropriate to address the various geotechnical analysis required through the life cycle of the drain stacking facilities, including recommended best practices and compliance with the standards and legislation. We have to ensure the physical stability of these structures and we have to establish critical controls to effectively manage the safe conditions of existing and operation, operating TSFs. As a matter of fact, dry stacking is a very hot topic in Brazil and globally. Commodities, as you know, including, including the mining industry, are an essential part of Brazilian economy. And we are still experiencing the consequences of the tailing them failures, especially when triggered by liquefaction, when triggered, in our case, by static liquefaction. These uh, massive mudslides have caused extensive humanitarian and environmental damage in our country. These recent accidents, such as Fundão, Brumadinho, uh, Mopoli, uh, to mention a few recent events, show that mine waste materials may perform worse than expected. And the consequences are a change in legislation worldwide and a shift in industry practice, moving from paying dams to dry stacking. And that's what brings us here today. So I hope that uh, all professionals that are here with us today and tomorrow can benefit from the experience from our speakers, giving us uh, a broad perspective of the challenges that we have to face in the design of these huge structures. I also would like to recall uh, that this webinar will be recorded and stored in the ABMS channel with open access in the future. Throughout the presentation, you can make questions by simply writing down the questions to our chat, and I'll see them and pass to our speakers. In have said that, I again welcome all of you that are here this morning, and I pass the word on to Lucas Brown for his opening remarks and then to our speakers. Thank you very much. Lucas, please. Thank you, Fernando. And just to say that I couldn't agree more with your opening remarks. Um, 
Well, firstly, I'd like to thank the ABMS, the Brazilian Association of Soil Mechanics, and especially Fernando Schneid uh, for the opportunity for the British government to collaborate on such an important topic. Fernando has links to the UK, as he mentioned, from when he completed his PhD in engineering science at the University of Oxford. And I hope that today and tomorrow's webinars can be the beginning of a fruitful collaboration between the British government, British companies and institutions with the ABMS. Since the Mariana Tailings Dam disaster in 2015, the British government in Brazil has worked proactively on the agenda of safety, transparency and innovation for mining waste management. We at the British Consulate in Belo Horizonte, which lead the mining sector in Brazil, followed the developments of the Church of England's Investor Mining and Tailing Safety Initiative very closely, and we celebrated the launch of the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, the GISTM, in August 2020. I believe that these initiatives, deliveries, and a clear change of mindset from the miners mark the beginning of a decade of change for the mining sector, based on ESG values and goals for zero environmental and social harm. We recognize the academic, technical, and professional excellence in Brazil and want to collaborate with local partners so that the best global practices are implemented in the Brazilian mining sector. Due to the increased safety and environmental demands for the mining sector, the topic of dry stacking has become increasingly important as another solution to tailing storage facilities. However, this relatively new technology is yet to be implemented at large scale within the sector. There are still a relatively low number of new projects and perhaps the greatest trend signals the application of dry stacking technology to existing tailings facilities. What we do know is that each dam operation and location is different and has its own peculiarities. I'm really excited that we're kicking off this discussion for a Brazilian context. I think we all agree that mining operators face similar challenges all over the world and therefore transparency and international collaboration is key, especially when we are about to embark on the application of new innovative technologies. The following two webinars will focus on key issues around dry stacking, comparing the Brazilian and global context. Firstly, today's session on geotechnical standards and tomorrow, legislation and regulation. I hope that these discussions are productive and that we can continue to collaborate on such an important issue. Fernando. Back to you. Okay, Lucas, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I will say that I'm very excited about the possibilities that uh, are foreseen in the future. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a long term collaboration between Brazil and UK. There are colleagues, British colleagues, that are now working regularly in Brazil. And uh, I think that uh, we can combine efforts to face the challenge of dry stacking. Uh, we can now move to our British speakers, uh, Martha Leeds and Richard Elmer from Knights Old, who will deliver the first presentation. Martha Leeds is a geotechnical engineer and works with projects globally to help deliver pragmatic and innovative geotechnical solutions for payments storage. She specializes in PSF auditors uh, GISTM conformance and stability analysis. Richard Elmer joined Knight PSO Limited in 2013 and now leads the UK operation. Richard is a geotechnical specialist with over 30 years of experience, specializing in mine waste facility designs and review. He is responsible for a significant portfolio of mine waste facility reviews and audits undertaken from the London office globally, and regularly presents on mine waste and payment manage best, best practice at industry seminars and conference, conferences. The presentation title is The Watering Filter Tailing Stacks, Best Practice and Common Challenges. Please, Mark and Richard, the floor is yours. Um, hello, um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. 
Um, I'm Martha. Um, this is Richard Elmer. Hi, good to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah, and we're, we're ready to begin. Thank you. So thank you for tuning in to watch our presentations today. And thank you to the DIT and uh, ABMS for organizing this mining dialogue on dry stack tailings. Um, as has been said, my name is Martha Needs. I'm a geotechnical engineer with Knight Peasel Consulting in the UK. And I'm accompanied by Rich Elmer, who is our director and principal geotechnical engineer. Today, our presentation will be on best practice and common challenges for dewater ta tailing stack facilities. Here is a brief outline of our presentation, where we will begin with a short introduction to Knight Peasold. We will then briefly discuss what dewatered filter tailings are and how they are processed. And then we will cover design and operational considerations in line with best practice and common challenges faced. So this is just a brief introduction to us. This is a photo of just some of our team at the Tower of London, which is located near our office. We're an international company with offices all over the globe, including several in South America. Knight Peasold offer consulting services in the mining power and water sectors and have around 1,100 staff worldwide. We celebrated our centenary last year and we have been re-established in the UK for nearly 10 years. Our London office focuses on mine waste and we provide pragmatic and innovative solutions for our clients worldwide, as shown on the map presented. So what are dewatered de filtered tailings and how are they different from conventional slurry? So these tailings are dewatered to a moisture content of around 20% and below. Because of this, we tend not to use the term dry stack as it can be misleading as the facilities are, are not dry. However, in comparison to conventional slurry, which typically has 60 to 80% moisture content, it is certainly the drier option. Dewatered filter tailings are normally transported by conveyor or truck and then are spread and compacted to form an unsaturated tailings landform. The diagram on screen shows the tailings moisture content spectrum with conventional slurry to the left hand side and filter cake to the right hand side. The filter cake often has a consistency of moist sand with geotechnical and hydraulic parameters that allow for stacking and compaction to maximize density and strength while thickened and paste tailings may be able to achieve beach slopes around 3 to 6%. Compacted dewater tailings may be stacked with stable slopes of 20 to 30% and above. Tailings filtration can be accomplished through either vacuum systems, mechanical press such as belt, drum, horizontal and vertical stack pressure plates, which is the video that can be shown on screen. Passive methods such as using geotextile assisted dewatering bags are also adopted, where slurry is pumped into bags that dewater under gravity. The filtration process basically accelerates the consolidation process that would naturally occur in slurry thickened or paste tailings over tens of years. The resulting filtered product is a filter cake that is firm with low compressibility and low hydraulic conductivity. So what considerations should be made for design? A good starting point for design are always the guidelines and standards we work with. As you would know, Brazilian federal law has called for the elimination of upstream dams and Brazilian operations are moving towards the adoption of stack facilities. In addition to the Brazilian standards, international guidelines such as the Canadian Dam Association and the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, GISTM, apply to filtered stack facilities. We have compared the Brazilian standards to the GISTM and found that they align well, but in some cases these international guidelines are more stringent than the country regulations. In, the, in these cases we suggest that the designer uses a more stringent regulation. So a bit about the tailings characteristics. The shear strength of dry stack tailings will vary depending on the moisture content, density of the tailings, and the drainage conditions within the stack. 
As with conventional facilities, it is important to recognize that the density, moisture content, and drainage conditions within the stack are changing as more tailings are placed on the stack. The tailings density and moisture content may vary depending on the filter efficiency and ore mineralogy. The compressibility of filtered tailings is an important consideration for stack design as it directly affects the stacking rate and configuration of the stack. The degree of saturation of the tailings is a function of porosity, which changes as the depth of the dry sack increases. If the filtered tailings are highly compressible, there is the potential for the porosity to decrease and become fully saturated. Additional loading could then give rise to excess pool pressures, which could cause stability problems. Another point to note is that oxidation of sulfides in the tailings can create high concentrations in low volumes of seepage water. Therefore, this option may not be practical for some ore types, and a detailed geochemical test is required. Now on to a bit about the facility design itself. A stack tailings facility needs to be designed to include the method of transport and deposition, the site topography, volume of tailings, and distance from the filter plant and tailings moisture content need to be accounted into this decision. As part of the design, provisions must be made to handle overly wet tailings. The design of the materials handling systems and equipment should be robust to handle a wide range of materials, unsaturated to saturated tailings. In general, it is good practice to place some compact, unsaturated tailings along the downstream end of the facility, forming a structural zone to support the facility. Behind the structural zone, the tailings can be placed with low compaction and may also include overly wet materials that may have low shear strength or high compressibility. The size and extent of the structural zone can be developed based on stability analysis to support and retain the materials behind the structural zone. The design basis for the structural zone needs to consider potential water management concerns and static and seismic loading scenarios as with conventional facilities. Our last notes on design uh, relating to climate and the water management. For most stack tailings facilities, the majority of the precipitation runs off the surface due to the low hydraulic conductivity of tailings and can be collected by surface water management channels. Dewater stack facilities should be designed with the tailing surface graded to drain water away from critical stability areas such as any downstream buttresses or structural zones, particularly during a wet season. Integrating surface water collection channels into the stack design can minimize the potential for infiltration through the stack and provide a way to manage surface water from the facility. Climate change and appropriate storm events should be taken into account when sizing the surface water management infrastructure, including upstream diversion systems. There are limited options to store water within a stack facility, whereas conventional tailings, tailings facilities can provide a mining operation with a buffer to maintain operations during dry months of the year. If water storage is needed for the plant, another water retainment facility must be considered. I'll now be handing over to Richard Alma to discuss the operational considerations. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Martha. That's an excellent, excellent first few slides there. Um, first of all, um, these these cons operational considerations <clears throat> have um, come up through uh, experience through constructing dry stacks over the past um, two, two, three years. Um, we've learned a lot from from the first ones that we designed and, and built. And, and this is kind of a summary of the lessons that we've learned over that period of considerations that really must be borne in mind when uh, operating a, a dry stack facility. The most important thing is that the operator must have a knowledge and understanding of the operation of the facility and operate it in accordance um, with the design. As opposed to a, a slurry facility, this uh, a dry stack uh, construction is really an earthworks construction. Um, the, the skills that you need um, are earthworks skills. So the contractors need to have experience in, in earthworks. 
um, you are taking a, a construction material from the end of the filter press, placing it in, in layers, typically 300 millimeters thick, and then compacting it um, to, to achieve its maximum dry density so that uh, the maximum shear strength is, is obtained. It's also really important that the, the filtration plant delivers the material at or around the optimum moisture content. We usually say <clears throat> um, around um, plus or minus 2% of optimum moisture content. Um, it's what we expect for the delivered material. But in wet climates, we'll often modify that so that it's at optimum or 3% below optimum. This, this allows some margin for wetting of the material um, during placement um, if, there's, if there's high rainfall events. So the key, the key thing is that, that contractors must, be, must understand how the material behaves and must be used to constructing embankments um, under, under variable climatic conditions. As Martha alluded to earlier, it's really important to get the stacking rate right. If you stack too too fast, too quickly, uh, the you can get a build up of poor water pressures in the in the stack. Um, so the rate of rise of the stack needs to allow uh, dissipation of of poor water pressures to avoid potential uh, in, instability. This is monitored through the construction period by installation of uh, piezometers and during the operational period by installation of piezometers to monitor poor pressure conditions, ideally vibrating wire piezometers. During construction, uh, dust can be a problem. Uh, you're trying to, to create a dry material and place it dry. So in areas of, um, of low rainfall and high wind, dust can be a problem. Dust generation can be a problem. This is usually simply <clears throat> um, simply avoided by operating sprinklers um, or, or having a sprinkler truck to, to dampen the dust. You don't need to worry too much about um, a large amounts of water entering the, uh, in, entering the stack because light sprinkling is sufficient to control the dust and it won't have an adverse effect on the overall stability of the, the stack. And the key thing as well is for operators to be aware of the risk of not following the, uh, um, the dry stack design. Uh, any modification to the system while on site needs to be passed back to the designer so that the implications of any design modification to suit the contractor is, is uh, addressed. Again, as Martha uh, alluded to, the water management is, is critically important to dry stack facilities. You want to minimize the amount of water that is passing over the, over the stack to minimize the amount of water that infiltrates through the stack. And this is achieved by the con construction of, um, construction of uh, surface water diversion channels uh, around where you're going to place your stack. It can be a, a costly uh, um, effort to, to build those uh, structures, uh, but it's, <clears throat> it's worth it to, to invest in proper surface water management ahead of construction because it uh, will be very costly to remediate a facility that has been negatively affected by uncontrolled surface water. One of the key issues that uh, we have found uh, in our, with the uh, construction and operation of a successful dry stack facility is how to handle outer specification material. The outer specification material can occur for a number of reasons. <clears throat> Primarily, it, it, it can be due to um, poorly functioning um, filtration equipment that can be caused by a number of um, a number of reasons. It could be um, the variable feed of the tailings um, caused by a difference in perhaps the ore mineralogy. It can be caused by um, um, by climatic conditions externally. So you can either and find yourself um, producing um, tailings filter cake that is greater than the optimum moisture content. Or you, even if you're producing good filter cake, it could be adversely affected by, um, by climatic conditions. 
it's absolutely vital that the, the field cake must remain within the optimal moisture content range as specified in, 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 this des, in the design. So to make sure that that happens, the filtration plant has to be operated and maintained correctly. There also needs to be backup um, filtration uh, machinery uh, so that uh, there is continuous filter cake production should there either be a breakdown <clears throat> or if there is a, um, or if there's routine maintenance of the, of the filter presses. The filter cake once produced uh, should be placed on the tailing storage facility as, as quickly as possible, particularly in wet climates, um, as, as would be seen in, in, in Brazil. Uh, what we don't want is a, is a pile of, of nice dry filter cake that then gets rained upon um, and the moisture content goes too high and is not placed at the correct, um, the correct moisture content. So there are, there are ways of dealing with out of um, specification material that we have developed um, during the operation of these facilities. Uh, one that would seem to be the easiest is to have uh, a location to, straw, to, to store filter cake um, a covered area to store filter cake before it's placed. Um, that can present problems because you need a large footprint for the storage and to, to construct um, a suitable um, warehousing. Again, this is an expensive operation, but that can it can be done, and sometimes uh, you know temporary structures can be used. Also, the tailings, the filter cake tailings, can be kept dry by placement of tarpaulins. Um, uh, over over the existing um, over the filter cake, but that would only work, work on low um, throughput, low throughput um, type of um, operations. So, if you're still um, ending up with overly wet uh, filter cake, um, as as Martha said in the design considerations, uh, the design should allow for uh, an area where the overly wet material um, can be stored uh, or permanently behind the structural zone. So the structural zone will have um, very tight requirements in terms of as placed um, moisture content at or below the optimum moisture content. It will also have very strict testing conditions uh, to prove that the density, maximum dry density has been reached through, through compaction. Um, so it's, it's a combination of having a uh, filter cake at the, at the correct moisture content, building it correctly um, in terms of layer thickness and compaction and testing and proving that that density has been achieved so that you can prove that you have your structural zone at the, typically at the front end of the facility and any outer specification material, as you can see on the, on the picture here, um, is placed at the back of the facility. It's interesting that um, we have found through experience as well that what might be delivered to the TSF um, as out of specification material and placed at the back gradually uh, improves in properties as it drains naturally and, um, and consolidates and, and strength increases through time. So um, in time, the, the outer spec material at the back of the facility um, often would then comply um, later and we've proven that through through testing of that material um, days and weeks after after placement and we can then retrospectively prove that it meets the, the design specification so um, that's just a, a, a few um, a few points or to consider with the uh, um, the development of uh, an operational dry stack facility um, and we've, we've learned how to uh, deal with these challenges in, on, a, on various operations uh, uh, around the world. Um, but we, yeah, we thought that would be uh, uh, an, a general introduction to, to uh, the lessons that we have learned very specifically for the, for, for the facilities we've designed and constructed, um, but would welcome um, wider discussion to this um to this forum um at, at, at any point so thank thank you for listening
Fernando, your mic. Microphone is muted. Okay, I'm on now. Okay, so Martha and Richard, thank you very much for your presentation. I should say that there are lots of questions that are already coming to us. Uh, so we're going to move to the presentation from the Brazilian speakers, Rafael Bitar and Ana Luisa, and later on we'll come back and ask the questions for all of you. So the Brazilian speakers are Rafael Bitar and Ana Luisa Rizzoli from Valio, from Vail. Rafael Bitar is a civil and geotechnical engineer, graduated from the UFOP School of Mines. He has more than 15 years of experience in the area of geomechanics, applied to mining with an MBA in management from FGV and Fundação Dom Cabral. Through his career, he has held various positions in Brazil and abroad, in operation, design, consulting, auditing of dams, and more recently as an executive linked to the management of mining tailings. He's currently director of geomechanics at Valley, being responsible for the company's specialist regulatory area globally. Ana Luisa Cesar Rizzoli is a geotechnical engineer with, with experience in road civil engineering works, hydropower dams, and geotechnical mining structures, especially waste rock dumps and dry stacks. Works at Valley's geotechnical project team, coordinating rock dumps and dry stack projects, experimental landfills for filter tailings, and R&D projects to reduce moisture content in filter tailings, characterization of waste rocks and filter tailings, development of alternatives for tailing disposal, development and development of tools for sequencing waste rocks and filter tailing piles. Presentation title is uh, Perspectives and Challenges for Filter Tailings Disposal. Please, Rafael and Lisa, I move it to you. Thank you, Professor Fernando and the BMS by the keen invitation for us here to present a bit of our journey in tailings management. As Fernando mentioned, uh, we are here so focused in to develop uh, the best available technology to deal with our tailings, right? I'm, as mentioned, I'm in current serving as a global director on tailings and waste management for Bali, and I will divide here the presentation today with uh, my colleague, Anna. If you can share the presentation. Yes. Thank you. How would you like to, to start? Next slide, please. Yes. How would you like to start just to show our tailings and dams management journey? Uh, since 2019, Val has worked a lot to improve uh, our practices, starting by the governance. A lot of things was changed uh, after Brumadinho right, of the B1 failure. One thing was the reinforcement of the governance on the three line of defense model, a new era. I'm joined Valley after the B1 failure. My area is a new in the company. It's an era of operation excellence and safety that's outside of the operation. It, it's in charge to implement uh, tailings and dam management system to implement uh, best brights in the company globally, right? Uh, a geotechnical risk committed was created as well. Uh, the accountable executive role was implemented as well to deal with tailings matters. Uh, additional to that, uh, some of the international uh, best practices has been applied since 2019. One is the implementation of what you call it here, TDMS, that coming from the tailings and dams management system. It's our system when we have our routine process standards roles and responsibilities well defined and ends aligned uh, with GISTM, what I mentioned afterwards. Uh, the engineer of record was also implemented in 2020 for value operations, especially in Brazil, because it was a reality for value outside Brazil for a long time, right? It's also implemented in the Penantanes review boards, 
and another important uh, price is to improve governance, right? A huge problem of SEs, of drilling and understanding of the facilities was also implemented. And uh, in 2020, uh, 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 a formal commitment of value management into adoption of GISTM, what's really important to us and really important uh, for the mining industry as well as pointed out by Lucas in his remarks, right? Uh, we are working very hard since 2019 into implement GISTM. We did an uh, first assessment at the end of 2021 and show us that we are around 60% and we are planning to reach at the end of this year is around 90% of uh, compliance with GISTM, right? We are now joining to be aligned uh, in, in, in compliance with GISTM for a very high and, and, uh, and extreme consequence facilities by 2023, out middle of 2023. Just to, to, uh, to show uh, how future tailings are associated with our tailings management overall strategy, right? We are de risking value, and part of the, the, this de risking process is to adopt future tailings in some of our operations in the south of Brazil. Vale have a big advantage of. Most of our tailings, uh, most of our ore come from dry process in the north. We don't have tailings in the north. Around 70% of our production come from north. There's no tailings there. In the south, we are uh, implementing four uh, filtering plants and to move from uh, wet tailings to dry tailings in that operation. Or a big amount of the tailings, not all, but a big amount we move it for for dry tailings, right? And we also develop in technology for co-products. What this means, it's try to reduce the amount of tailings by, by uh, generate other type of products like sands, like uh, some material for pavements and other things that is being developed with uh, a lot of research and development, right? And this was accelerated after uh, B1 failure right, to reduce the amount of tailings. And our focus is to uh, implement GISTM and to be in compliance with GISTM, following uh, the need to have a more transparent, a more uh, rigorous approach to deal with tailings matters. And of course, all of this strategy, it's founded in a cultural transformation journey uh, where we, we emphasize uh, behaviors like transparency, commitment, uh, respect, uh, ethics, etc. right? Uh, full and, and transparent dialogue as well. Next slide, please. Here, just put in this, that slide some of my own thoughts on, on this topic, right? Some of important considerations that come from my own experience uh, with this uh, materials on this uh, filtering tailings issue, right? I think the first one is we need to change mindset, right? We need to deal with things not more with a residue, but but need with things like a product. This is an important change of mindset in the mining industry. Uh, when we start to thinking about the design, we need to work integrated, right? Technology process should work together with the job techniques. We need to work integrated, right? Uh, the process should understand the geotechnical requirements and the geotechnical requirements need to understand and need to look uh, the, the, the types of technology uh, that, it's, uh, that could be applied to the, that project. What this means, we need to integrate the design in the mine site characteristic. We need to understand the mineral process. The mineral process will lead the, the need uh, the, the, the type of things, the type of things will, will lead us, the technology selection, the technology selection need to be associated with the things handling strategy and will be associated with design control. A lot of this was mentioned in the previous presentation by, by KP, right? Understand the characteristic of the things and the quantity of finds. Really, it's a really important statement. Findings will play an important role in the project. We need to look the, the type of things that's being generated, understand this. This could 
be an important optimization uh, aspect for your project. We need to understand and you need to, to look uh, how the tailings is being generated in our process uh, and to define the best strategy, not looking uh, just one solution, but uh, integrated solutions for your tailings, right? Uh, trying to select alternatives uh, based on the tailings characteristic process, etc. Instrumentation and monitoring here from the mine to the tailings facility are essential, right? The tailings, uh, one thing that, uh, the only thing that you'll be sure in a, ta in a future in tailings are, is that your tailings will change over the time, right? Your tailings will change and to, to monitor in the process since the mine uh, through the plant, uh, well-stabilized st process to ensure the things characteristic that will be uh, that will be disposed. Adaptive and resilient design. This is so important, right? Uh, we need uh, the facility need to be constantly reviewed to incorporate the performance of the tailings behavior. As I have mentioned, the tailings will change, right? And design should be account to potential change in the tailings characteristics, right? Ensure that the facility have a well-controlled and less variable structural zone, as I mentioned in the previous presentation as well, right? Appear to be an adequate approach. Mining tailings are complex. This, uh, this is a statement that came from a, a paper from Morgan in, in, uh, uh, 20 years ago. Sometimes they behave better than expected and other times they behave worse than expected. We need to to be aware that this could happen in your facility. Especially in Brazil and in Bali, we are facing an important challenge that we are facing a high, hate, uh, a high production rates, high height facilities uh, in, a wet, in a wet country, right? In well-defined uh, wet period. And this is a key driver for the project. Engineer of Hacker is a key role player and is recommended to retain the designer company as a new war, right? It's really important because, as I mentioned, things will change, behavior will change, and you need to constantly uh, uh, update the design based on this, and the design needs to be adapt adaptive uh, for this potential change. And last but not least, uh, drainage, it's a really important aspect, right? Especially in net countries and high height facilities, both internal and superficial, it's one of the most important aspects in the facility design. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, just to, to reinforce part of our journey, uh, Anna will give you more details uh, during his her presentation, but uh, given that we are not learning process here, right? Uh, there's no ready solution for, for the challenge, right? And we are together the operational challenge. We need to spend energy and, and research and develop it. And Val have an important partnership with uh, a federal university of Rio Grande do Sul that's led by Professor Milo. This is some of the works that's being done there in terms of research and development, which is really important, right? As I said, it's a learning process and we need to, to learn with the mistakes, but we also need to learn uh, with the with the academy and with the research, right? Just having this brief introduction and in where we are, how future things are associated with the overall strategy of Vale, I'll hand over to Anna for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. So uh, I'm Anna. I work in the geotechnical team in Valley, and I'm going to present a little bit how we are in right now in, in future tailings designs and, 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 and production, everything. So we have a long journey on future tailings. We first studied a pile of filtration plan in 2012, and it was assembled on 2015. Then in 2018, we had our first experimental embankment in Cianita. This is a, a, a major step in, in, in future tailings studies. Then uh, in 2019, we started our, our characterization program. It is a program that we want to, character, 
to, to get samples of all future tailings that are uh, planted to, to have dry stacks. And we have uh, already done um, tests for, uh, I think like four or five sites in Valley. Then in 2020, we did our first pilot uh, Itabira experimental embankment. This is, it was an embankment that we didn't have any uh, compaction uh, equipments. We only did with mining equipments. And then uh, last year, we did the Brukutu experimental embankment where we started to, to, to work with uh, compaction and and uh, equipment and Itabira too. Like Itabira, we, we have just finished this year uh, its experimental embankment. And for next years, we are planning for Mariana, Fabrica, other sites, experimental embankments, especially because uh, they are very different from uh, Itabira and Brukutu, that was the first materials that we tested. So, just I oops I'm going back to the the agenda here we did the first one this value journey and future tailings uh, we are going to talk about process and its risks experimental embankments good practices and uh, and R&D projects. So in here, in processing its risks, we have the disposal process uh, in here. So first we have the filtration plant. And in here, we have some, uh, several controls. We have to make an important observation that the quadrilateral ferrifero is, is, is a R iron ore formation that have have highly weathered rocks so our tailings are natural finer and we will show you the grain side distribution um right uh, in, in the few slides uh other important information and we have a, a high generation rate today we are planning for future in tabita more than seven thousand tons uh, of tailings per day this is uh, a rate that's more than two times higher than the worldwide uh, existing filtration rate today. So the big issue in, in, in for Valley in Brazil are the high range rates that we have. After the filtration, uh, the material goes to a stockpile and the, the trucks uh, load and transport it to the to dumping it on the the dry stack. Then the dozer is thread and the material, and we start the compaction with vibratory rollers. And after the compaction, we do control tests to have the compaction degree needed to re release the work site. And the process starts all over again. And how we, we do this is how we, we study in the experimental embankments. Um, it's important for us to, to know that usually when we uh, operated them, a uh, 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 mining them. You 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 build first, and then you operate, and maybe you can do another lift or or, or two or three. But you always are uh, uh, separating on time the construction part by in the operation part. In dry stack, you have like a, a, a different way of uh, looking at this because you are always uh, constructing and operating all at the same time. The, the operation of a dry strike is a, a construction. So that's very important for us to, to put on the mind on, on the mind of everybody that is 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 uh, responsible of of any any process in, in, in dry stacks. So in here I'm going to to show you uh, show you uh, uh, a filtration plant for Brukutu. Here we have the mine thickener, where we the power substation, the filtration plant itself, the tanks, sumps, and bed conveyor systems. It's uh, 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 is a huge infrastructure that we have for the for the for the material. And in here we have some typical designs that we have can be similar to the if with the previous uh, uh, presentation, it's important for us to know that here 
uh, when you have the tailings, uh, the material can be compacted or have uh, a, 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 a out of spec of out of of spec specification placed, as in the previous previous presentation was also said. And usually, because we have raised rock in the in the site, uh, we have some some structures that we have also uh, waste rock covering uh, or uh, a starting structure uh, and only future tailings too. It depends on the site, on the design. It's like we have a, a, a million ways of doing these dry stack uh, uh, designs. Okay. And here we have go to experimental embankments. I, I put it in here, uh, how we organize the experimental embank embankment itself. Uh, it's important that we have two parts. First, the geotechnical characterization in laboratory. So, um, and then the experimental embankment itself. All the data and the information of experimental embankments go to the, the stack projects. And the most important uh, document that uh, gets all this information is the operational manual of the dry stack. So uh, we have uh, some, some, some uh, steps in here. First, the geotechnical characterization. The most important thing that we want to understand is the optimal moisture content and the critical state line, how it will function and with all the all the stresses that the material will will get. So in here we have some examples of a, a, a critical state line. We usually want to work in the dilative uh, part of 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 the of the critical state line, but sometimes we have some some uh, non spec uh, materials that can go on the contracted um, contracted space. In here we have some stress paths. It is important to, for us to see uh, how it connects to its to the experimental embankment. Here we have for 0.6 meters uh, uh, lifts, we had a block uh, in the experimental embankment and all the stress paths were dilative. And for one meter block samples that we had a, a, a one meter lift, we had a contracted behavior in one, um, in one stress path. So it's important to, to understand this before we start the experimental embankment. So then we go in the experimental embankment itself. The first part is com is very close to the process team because you want to understand the grain size range, the filtration efficiency, instability, and how the filtration will work. So in here, I have some some process instabilities that we un were understanding. In Tabira and Brukutu are the major sites that are operating uh, dry stacks right now. So in in green, we have what we have known uh, by the experimental embankments. So the experimental embankments have, have a, a, a short time uh, of, of construction. So we, we didn't, we couldn't uh, understand all the range of material. And in yellow, we have all the mean daily production that we had in the, in the site. So it is important to see this difference and to understand how it goes in the project, because sometimes what is in yellow is out of spec or not. So it depends on the design team. And it is important for you to know how the, 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 the studied material, uh, the range that we have studied, and always we want to uh, get broader and broader in, in, this, in, this, in this range, okay? Then uh, we have the moisture content. Uh, the previous presentation, the, uh, you said about uh, getting the the optimal moisture content. In here, we have in 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 green 
the, the range of Ochman content for those two materials. And we see that the, the material is not getting out of the, out of, out of the, of the fruitation plant in the, in the optimal moisture content. So you, you see here that our main challenge in Brazil and in Valley is getting the moisture content in the optimal moisture content. So it's, in, in, and this varies a lot because of the grain size distribution in here. We have a 10 micron uh, materials that are passing here that is very fine and get uh, a lot of moisture, the, the, it arises the moisture content. And then we have another um, control that is, is the iron content. Uh, usually it doesn't um, uh, matter a lot in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the way the tannins will behave, but usually we, we get, we measure this because it is an instability indicator. So if you get a, a high iron content on the future tailings, something is not, correct on the future plan so you can go you have to go back and understand what is happening so those are the three main indicators of future tailings on the plant grain size distribution moisture content and iron content then uh, we go in the geotechnical and construction part that we want to understand that the equipment traffic moisture that is safe for equipments go inside the, the, the dry stack. So if you see in the next slide, uh, in the last slide, that we had high moisture content sometimes. So it, it's what's the moisture that is safe for equipments to go and, and, and start the jobs. And then we understand the leaf thickness. So in, in compaction, how uh, uh, we will compact the compact roller specification, number of roller passes, a weight, all the specification that you want to get uh, the correct uh, compaction grade of the project. Then uh, we want to understand the, all the operational issues that may occur, like the generation. We usually do lining tests and behavior after rainfall events that is very important how you're going to operate so in here i want to show you uh, some dust generation that we had on flotation tailings on itabira it's uh, sometimes we couldn't even work in the dry stack because it wasn't possible for for and, and it wasn't safe for for people to be here so it's important to to get in understand uh, how to to minimize this. Usually we use we use water and polymers. So, but it is important for for us to measure that and understand how to 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 make it uh, less of uh, less often the this this dust generation. Then the behavior after rainfalls, like in Brazil, we have a, a, a high rate of, 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 of rainfalls. So in here, we, we have uh, the Itabira experimental uh, embankment after a, a big rainfall. We had a, a 170 millimeters rainfall in four days. Uh, we didn't operate it these days, but when we go, 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 we went back in here. Uh, how this was? How it was the 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 experimental embankments? In here we have uh, the place that we we compacted. We get a one percent grade, and after the all this amount of rainfall, we had like a perfect uh, place to go back and work. So everything was ready, and it. The compaction was not only useful for geotechnical parameters, but for uh, the, the, man, the the operational um, recover that we needed to, to, to go back in here. So here is also the, the where we go in, 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 in the experimental embankment. This is a place that is compacted with 10% grade, and you see that you have some problems in here. 
And in here we have uh, the, the slope that is uncompacted because it's not safe for, for the compact, for the rollers to go here. But it, it sees the importance of the protection of the future tailings because you have some problems in here after the rainfall. And all this place that is in red, it was only a, a, a disposal of future tailings with no compacted compaction and with more than 10% grade. And you see here all these problems that we had in here, uh, two meters width and, and four meter depth um, erosions. And we, we, we spent it like a few days to, to recover all that to get in here. So uh, the importance of compaction is on, not only for, for geotechnical parameters, but for all operational matters too. Um, we also want to understand experimental embankments, uh, efficiencies, productivity, labor and equipment use is very important for us to to manage uh, the, the dry stack in the future. Moisture content loss, as I said, the moisture content usually is higher than the compact, the, the optimal con, uh, moisture content. So this is the moisture reduction is the critical path for us in the cycle time of the dry stacks. So everything here goes to the dry stack uh, projects and we have some other studies in that for moisture content loss alternatives uh, that are additives or lime. Uh, we have also strength improvement alternatives. There are agglomerants and cement. Some of them are, are in, in partnership with uh, the Rio Grande do Sul University too, that uh, Rafael said. So here we have all the experimental embankments that we have done uh, until now. We have Cianita that was only mine equipments and no vibratory holder available. The Cianita experimental embankments was very focused on filtration selection objective that um, Valley uh, wanted to understand the filtration and not the disposal itself. Then the pilot Itabira uh, experimental embankment that was meant to understand the geotechnical parameters. And uh, we did a co-disposal study too. For Ita Brukutu and Itabira uh, um, experimental embankments, we had all earthworks equipment available. Geotechnical and operational objective uh, was, uh, was studied in here. So um, all these phases that we, we, we went through in Tabira and Brukutu uh, experimental embankments. In here, I just want to put it what we have tested. Like in Cianita, we have tested flotation tailings, 90, 10 total tailings. That means that you have 90% of flotation tailings and 10% slimes. So, and we, we change it, uh, 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 the rate in here, the percentage of slimes to understand uh, the difference of these materials. We also test this slime itself. The Itabira pilot test, what we tested in Brukutu here is the image of Itabira experimental embankments. So we have here uh, the test itself, the laboratory uh, that was uh, meant to do all the tests in here, lining tests, it was e equipments. Here we have the lime and cement test too. So it's a huge structure to understand how to operate uh, the materials. Also in here, I have some pictures of the operation itself of the experimental embankments. Here we have the transportation. Uh, dumping in here on the material, moisture content sampling, spreading, compaction, and control and release. These are the main parts of the of the experimental embankment for us to understand how to operate the materials. So going back here, we have good practices. Um, in here, um, we have three sites right now operating dry stacks. Uh, most of them 
use operational slots. Here are Cianita and Contrapilhamento e Poema Borrachudo. Each slot in here uh, is, is have a volume of one day of production. So uh, if you go here, you, you know uh, which day it was operated and the material that came here. And usually this, uh, uh, for each slot, you are doing one one um, one operational uh, work here. So maybe on red you are receiving the material, on yellow you're compacting, on on pink maybe you're uh, getting the moisture content corrected. So uh, it's important. This is a good practice that is very important for us because you can get what happened in each slot and uh, you you can capture the material from one day so it's it's a, a, a very interesting thing that i think that san marco friends also do that uh in their operations too uh, we are getting uh all control and release of the lifts automatized by um, apps so in here the the laboratory uh, they usually get all the information, the, the compaction grade, moisture content, and in, it, it can go to an app and it, it, it will be uh, important for us to, to have like a uh, uh, S-Build uh, of, of the dry stack. It's a routine on management and sample control applications né, for better technology, logical sample control. We also do productivity management here. We have like the productivity with the rainfalls that we had during the year. And also uh, in experimental embankments, we did a, uh, we had a, a app for getting all the information all of uh, the time that we spent for each activity for us, for us to plan the dry stack itself. So we did the identification of productivity bottlenecks and updating of the dynamic simulations. All our, our dry stacks projects, they usually have a, a dynamic simulation after it, it's ready to, 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 to be built. So it is important for us to check with real data if the dynamic simulation of how to build the structure is correct or not. Then uh, we have our research and development projects. I, I just put it in some of them in here. We have chemical binders that can be cement, lime, gel polymeters. Gel polymeters is, is interesting because we use the tailings itself to get it. So it's a co-product and also a way to, to get better tailings in the future. Uh, geo bags, uh, we have operated some geo bags on Brukutu mine. Uh, filtration uh, additives for moisture content reduction. So our main issue right now is getting the moisture content correct. And we have some, we have been testing some additives to getting that better, okay. Uh, another important uh, project that we have is particle breakage in high confining pressures. Uh, here we getting we are getting valley more uh, um, dry stacks of, of 300 meters. So it's very high, very, uh, con very high stresses. So you want to understand if we had any parkets a particle breakage after getting all these stresses. So in here, in here we also have a, a, a project with GCG that we are studying the tailings behavior for all our tailings. And we are also researching new equipments for moisture content reduction. This is very important for us, not only in the in the in the plant, but after it. So um, it's uh, we are trying to get uh, all in 
all the moisture reduction in all the process in the plant and after uh, the, the, the filtration. For particle breakage, I would like you to, to see here, uh, we did some two, two types of tests, static and dynamic. So here is the, the grain size distribution after all, all these tests that we had. So we, we had no particle breakage for, for MPA and on, on drain tests and MPA for on drain tests. It's very important for us because uh, it means that we have the same uh, behavior after all all this all this pressure in the in the all these stresses in the in the dry stack, and we also did a dynamic tri triaxial compression compression tests. This was meant to to capture if the the compaction roller was getting any 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 Part, part, particle break, breakage, and we only saw some particle breakage at the stresses of 83 uh, MPA that is way high than the, the stresses that the roller or even the, the height of the, of the dry stack would do. And even this particle breakage was within the variation of the range of the material itself. So uh, those are two important uh, tests that we did, and we have uh, much more research and development going on on Valley and with our partners. So I would like to, to thank you for your time, and uh, that's all that I have for today. Una and Rafael. Thank you very much for your presentation, very enlightening. Thanks to all of you, very comprehensive presentations. And uh, as a result of that, we have many, many questions. Uh, very interesting because some of these questions are rather general and some of them are very specific. Uh, I'll try to group them together to see whether you can uh, come, up, come up with uh, some, some answers. And, and also, interesting enough, uh, the questions, they actually uh, cover most of the important issues that I understand are related to the design of these, of these, uh, of these things, right? So I'll ask them, uh, you can feel free to answer each of you whenever you feel that you've got some contribution, just uh, come up with some answers, there is no problem, right? Uh, I'll start with a very general one, very general one. This is Michelle at 10.09. Very general question, just a warming up for our discussion. And uh, 10.08, Michelle Fontes, 10.08, and he says, the, the, uh, I believe that this is the biggest challenge for weight piles when using the disposal method in the light of lack of technical requirements. So I guess the question is, where do we stand in that? We've got reasonable guidelines for design, or there are uncertainties still to be covered in this huge, very high uh, dry stacking that we are about to build or are building? Anyone feels comfortable? <laughs> um, well, I, I think I think it's they are there are um, a lot of standard geotechnical um, requirements that that these structures are need, need to conform with. So um, our designs um, are based on on geotechnical modelling slope stability modeling as with, with any, any embankment, whether it's a tailings embankment or an earth embankment for, for, a, for a road or something, we still have the same basic geotechnical um, requirements. So I don't think it's a lack of technical requirements. Um, we design to meet the factors of safety set out in CDA or GISDM. Um, just because it's a stacked tailings facility, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, CDA doesn't apply to that top level. 
dam, exactly. But the, um, uh, the, the, the design requirements are, are still the same. So we have to prove that stability under all condi conditions, including post lift impact, uh, meets that 1.5 or 1.3 um, or 1.1 um, factor of safety, depending on which case we're looking at. So I do think there is there are requirements, and yeah, we we have to the TPA, GISTM, and the dry stack as much as we can. I don't know what I have got to say from that. Richard, I'll, I'll, I'll try to follow up on them on, on that on that question and on your answer actually. Uh, going through the question from Christian at 1027. And uh, first you mentioned that uh, the best examples of this type of solutions are in arid, arid areas, Chile, Australia, uh, with a dry climate, right? But then he asks, I would like to know your opinion about dry stacking in humid climate. And if it really would be a solution, uh, or it would be a new problem for the future. And, and, and I think that uh, you have stressed the point that it's important to control the water content, plus to minus two. When it's wet from optimum, you can generate more pressure. And when, when it's dry from optimum, you might have dust. But what are the geomechanical implications, for instance, of uh, compacting dry from optimum? Are the problems others that dust? Yeah. So, so we wouldn't compact dry of, or too dry of optimum. We would add water. Uh, so you moisture condition the soil as you would if you're building a, a, a standard embankment. So you need to bring up the moisture content in arid areas. Um, we've had a, a, obviously a bigger problem is in humid climates, as, as Christian notes. But we have successfully built uh, filter tailings facilities in those human environments. And that's what our presentation was focused on how to deal with that situation. We often find um, that uh, after a period of heavy rainfall, the top of the stack, the top, I know, 100 millimeters can be very, very wet. Actually, it was like, like um, Anna showed as, as well on, on some of her slides. You have a, a, a a layer that that can be um, very wet. Um, sometimes we can scrape that, and you start your next layer, next stack. In when it stops raining, having scraped it and place it, place the next layer. Um, once once you cleared off the, the the slimes layer, the other thing we found as well is that zone the construction. There's an opportunity for that top layer to then drain and consolidate itself. Um, and then you can continue stacking. One of the key things of managing that wet climate is exactly as Anna said, it's compacting that top layer and having that 1% grade. We, I agree with 1%, that's what we design in. And you, you have very little, very little erosion then. You will get a little bit softening on very top, but it doesn't go very deep. And so it's not a, a, a massive problem, but you do have to have a lot of plants and um, knowledgeable contractors to, to, to work with that. In extreme conditions, we have sometimes had to put a layer of waste rock into the into the stack. That encourages drainage. It also provides a platform to, to build the next the next layer from. Um, and that's one of the other observations of stacked facilities is that it is plant and staff intensive. Um, you need a lot of um, yeah, it, it's it's as again as, as I said, I, I might have been remembered actually. It's it's a, it's a constant operation. Um, it's not it's it's not you uh, you don't design it, build it, and operate it. You design it and operate it. Um, so it's very intensive in terms of both plants and staff and quality control. Um, that's another very important part to getting proving that you're acting to your um, maximum. Or, to, to your target, 95% say of maximum dry density and, and so on. Um, but all these things can be done in the environment. We've done it. Um, it. It takes time and you need to be a bit flexible in terms of 
where you're placing and allowing the wetter material to dry out and you know the structural zone is really important in that whole process as well so yeah okay, that's, that sort of answers the question there. Fernando, just to compliment here, just uh, some commentaries in here. I think that, as I have mentioned, it's a learning process, right? We are learning with this in our wet, uh, wet regions, like in Brazil, for example. Uh, we have a strategy, of course, we need to apply the best available engineering, best available technology, best available practice, have a robust governance in the process to incorporate the learnings on the, the, the process, right? And again, uh, we need to learn, right? We need to see what happened, especially when the piles are not so big yet, right? Uh, we need to develop uh, and chains in the project. It's, a, as I mentioned, it's adaptive, adaptive uh, engineering, right? We need to apply in this type of facility. Okay, I, I, I with you both. Uh, and I see in the question uh, some concerns about uh, the geotechnical performance of these, uh, these tables, right? And uh, Richard has concentrated on or has mentioned the problem of water content. And Bruno, Bruno here at 10, uh, 1031, uh, has gone one step ahead. He's gone to this idea of, uh, of zoning these structures, right? Uh, it says that uh, even when considering a well-built tailings dam, the liquefaction uh, could be, uh, whether liquefaction can be considered. And I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that, because we are talking about zonal tailings. Marta has mentioned that. There is a structure downstream, and there is a low compaction material upstream from this from the zone right and and the question is actually what Bruno is suggesting under these conditions how to prevent the low compaction upstream zone from being saturated and if it gets saturated liquefaction is a problem is it still a problem in this dry stacking uh, shall I answer that um, so liquefaction can be a problem, yes, with dry stacking. Uh, one way that we have dealt with that upstream less uh, or outer spec material is um, on one project we have an upstream drainage for chimney drainage at the back of the stack, which um, over time has led to the consolidation of the poorer material. Um, of it so it drains into the into the drain at the at the back and then down and through the basal drainage so um, it doesn't necessarily stay in that outer spec condition um, for the life of the facility there will be gradual consolidation and improvement of properties, um, through time but again we we would undertake um, a, a liquefaction um, assessment uh, as well uh, just on on as we would um, any other earthworks. So you still need to bear that in mind. I mean, it is less likely to fail in a, um, uh, to, uh, to make a buy. Um, and uh, if you keep it, ensure that the, uh, the, 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 the drainage is installed properly, properly to keep the, the phreatic surface low, to minimize that saturated zone. That will help, but that all goes into the analysis during the design process so that uh, can't ignore liquefaction in a dry stack. That's the, the, the short answer to Bruno's question. Yeah, I think that the key component is to ensure uh, gelatin materials in this structural zone, right? We need to ensure that you all the time have gelatin material in this structural zone. And of course, we have uh, a good drainage system. And what we, we need to think about this type of uh, facility is that we need to avoid flow failures, right? I think that the reduction of water, even in the, the out of specifications on, will help a lot to avoid 
risk of flow failures at the yeah, yeah. Cell, right? To gather this structural zone, uh, well control it to ensure uh, ge gelatin materials in, in it. Yeah, agree, completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting comment, actually. Uh, when you think about self weight consolidation, it is not effective in preventing liquefaction in hydraulic place materials, because you see these uh, materials in the reservoir that are 100 meter height and there is liquefaction potential all the way down. So I wonder if in this, uh, in this dry stacking, if self-weight consolidation will be effective. But then it comes to the second point, to the second remark from, from Rafael, suggesting that uh, drainage is extremely important, and I agree on that. So I'll, 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 I'll come to, to Bruno's remark Bruno at 10.35 makes a remark saying that um, uh, I believe that uh, that depends on the, 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 the performance depends on the drainage conditions, both on tailings dewatering and on potential excessive pore pressures when constructing tailing, when constructing tailing dams. Uh, I think that uh, the question that's being raised here within the discussions that we have is whether infiltration is an issue on these tailings, because we haven't talked a lot about permeability. Uh, with, the, with the heavy rains that we experience in Brazil, in this humid climate, infiltration is an issue or we are in a very low permeability material, that uh, infiltration is not one of the conditions that will uh, lead to saturation. I can talk a little bit about this topic. Uh, it depends a lot of which tailing are you talking about, because uh, the tailings changes on which side you are working on and how the process is. So if you are talking to flotation tailings, usually they have high infiltration rates, but actually uh, if you have a good uh, internal drainage, you can uh, dissipate all, all you, you can get it out the water and the dissipation of pore pressure are very uh, um, quick also. When you are talking about total tailings that we have a bunch of slimes inside it, uh, usually uh, you have lower permeabilities and with uh, the with the compaction, with the, 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 the drainage system, the, the superficial drainage system, usually we, it doesn't uh, saturate it because uh, you 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 don't infiltrate water, so it, you have two different materials that can 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 uh, work very differently, uh, and the, the design has to to understand this. Uh, it is important. Uh, it, it's an important thing for us to to evaluate on experimental embankments too, because what we have seen is that. Uh, the test that we do on laboratory, uh, they usually get uh, um, not uh, very um, good estimation, estimates of, 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 of permeability. Uh, when we see on, on, on site the material uh, flotation tailing, usually they, they, they have a high, higher permeability than when we test it on laboratory. So it's important for us to, to understand laboratory and in, in situ testing too, okay. Yeah, to just complementing, I think that one important aspect is the difference between infiltration and pore pressure, right? I think that looking at long term, uh, we will have infiltration in these facilities, right? It will be impossible to control some level of infiltration, especially in Brazil, we have not only infiltration from rains, but the groundwater, some of the sites are so subject to have groundwater uh, through to the, 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 the pile. 
uh, but uh, the difference is for pressure, right? For pressure, you depend on the characteristic of the tailings, characteristic of the operation, rate of rise, and other aspects associated with it. it and also to have in a good uh, drainage uh, design, you will reduce uh, the time of this water will go in, inside the, the facility because it, it's really important as again, to be a, a design that will be uh, incorporating the behavior of the bio during over the time, uh, analyzing the monitoring data, piezometers, incorporating this, uh, these aspects design, right? Okay, okay. You, you, you are about to move on to, a, to another issue, but slightly different issue. So if you allow me, I'll try to summarize what you're suggesting and please see what, whether you, you agree on that. If I understood correct from your perspective, it's extremely important to control the compaction conditions of the structure zone because you have to have dilative material. And this should be combined to the drainage, condi drainage conditions uh, that will have to uh, control either infiltration or the, or the regional hydrogeology of the area. You agree on that? Is this the, perfect, this is the reasonable combination for the design of these structures? Yeah, I think that uh, we need to, to think, Fernando, that we have a large experience in, in sand tailings facilities around the world, right? Uh, compacted sands in Chile. It's a common practice there with bios uh, over 200 meters high with compacted material. Of course, that's not, uh, the, the climate's a bit different, but in other side, it's a so seismic country, right? It's a huge experience in drainage and also in compaction of uh, sand materials, sealed sanding materials, right? You need to take and to see that experience and incorporate in the, in the local experience, right, as well. I fully agree, I fully agree. There is experience, yes, there is experience. Brazilian companies have done a lot in the past 30 years, uh, but at the same time, as a company, I've been agreeing with what you, you have said. Uh, there are challenges. There are challenges. There are new challenges for us to understand. So if I try to move on, I'll, I'll get the question from Sergio at 10.32 30, 10 uh, As a matter of fact, there was a discussion in, in the chat here. It was interesting. But then Sergio mentioned that uh, it all depends on this actual drainage conditions and, and I think that when he was talking about the stacking height he was talking about what uh, Ana Luisa was bringing in terms of the high stresses and the breakage of particles that is associated to that so probably the question is uh, uh, is particle break breakage a major problem in these high structures and do we have sufficient knowledge to deal with this problem in terms of design? I think we lost the question, then we dropped out. So I don't know if the others dropped yeah. out. Yeah. I think that Anna can answer it. I think we, I drop it. I, 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 how, how, what was the question, Professor? I think I, I just listened to 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 particle breakage okay. at the end. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I was talking about. I was talking about. There was a discussion talk about the height of these structures, right? And then I, I think that when people address the problem of the height, they are talking about the high stress high stresses of these structures and the possible association to particle breakage. You have put that into perspective on your presentation. And the question is, uh, are we already, we, we already understand this problem? Are we able to incorporate the effects of particle breakage into design? Actually, uh, the materials that we have tested until now uh, didn't had any particle breakage at the stresses that uh, 
of a 300 meters uh, stack. So um, all our projects, when you do uh, some triaxial, you you put it, you you get the 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 grain size distribution before and after to understand if any particle breakage is happening. And usually we don't. Uh, the only particle breakage that we had was with a 83 MPA that is not a, a, a it's not a, 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 a stress that we are we are supposed to see in in this in these dry stacks for like a 300 meters structures but uh, all all our, our uh, structures they are also instrumentated and we we can see with with uh, pressure cells uh, the 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 stresses that are 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 are, are getting in these structures so for now uh, we i haven't seen for, for any valleys tailings any particle breakage for 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 the stresses that are meant to to be in the in the stack but we are keeping we will keep uh, studying it so Good, good, good. But let me let me be a little bit provocative, right? We have talked about liquefaction, we are talking about particle breakage, we are talking about dilated materials that uh, may that will have strange softening after peak. Uh, what are the cons minimum constitutive models that we have to deal with for uh, tackling all these problems? Are we doing something something different from ordinary in terms of design, or can we deal with a limited type of analysis that is sufficient? I think that's not sufficient. I don't have the answer for your question, Fernando. In terms of constitutive model, we don't know yet okay? because we don't know the level of deformation that it's been that's being uh, measured for this type of facility. Again, I think that, of course, we need to have a starting point using a constitutive model that incorporates uh, uh, strain softening, of course, right? Uh, but we need to monitoring the facilities. You need uh, to feed the, the models, update the models with the learnings uh, of the monitoring and try to calibrate something more specific. Uh, during the, the period of operation, right? Uh, because it, of course, when you say, oh, I have a, uh, a pile with 300 meters high, it's, uh, it's a idealized, it, okay? But need uh, to learn, need to uh, review modeling, need to have the research being uh, incorporated into the, the practice, right? But there's no, no easy... No, I agree with Raphael. It's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's still in, still under development. Under, yeah, there's no quick answer. Yeah, and we don't. Another important thing, we don't. We, we need to think this different of a upstream tailings facility, right? And different of a waste rock facility. It's something in the middle, something different, right? We need to incorporate the learnings uh, and the monitoring of. So let's the models. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think that uh, we, we've got to learn as we go through. And there is a question from Zorzal. I think he, he sort of uh, uh, captures what we are saying. Some structures, this uh, zone, zone uh, design, the zone, the, 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 dry, the dry stacking divided in zones. Can they be considered or classified as an upstream raising embankment? Because you've got the structures only in the upstream and a low compacted material down. What are the major differences in terms of design in respect to an upstream raising embankment? Yeah, in my opinion, Fernando, it's a totally different, right? especially because the thing it's being mechanically placed in the upstream portion if in the uh, out of specification zone right it's different of a hydraulic placement 
the level of saturation may be different, right? And again, uh, the viability of a flow failure, it's a major difference when you compare with upstream uh, facility that's totally saturated, uh, normally saturated upstream, right? And it's hydraulic in place. It, for me, this is the, the big difference. Yeah, I would, I would just add as well that um, the material that we're placing upstream isn't necessarily that that different. As I was saying before, it it improves in quality through through time, through through drainage and consolidation. Um, on some projects as well, um, it's just the, the non-structural zone is just an easing of the CQA testing. Um, so it's it's material that visually doesn't really conform. Uh, we focus on ensuring that that front zone is fully compliant with the with the design and then the, then test the material at the back later and to, to check that it, uh, it then complies. So it's not we're not really talking about I, I think the answer is short answer I think is no <laughs> zoz out um, but um, yeah I guess it also depends a little bit on the geometry of and it can kind of look a bit like an upstream phase because if you're identifying the structural zone front face of, of the stack, it could look that way, but it's it's engineered very differently. Um, yet the material in the non-structural zone is still being placed and hopefully compacted depending on how wet it is. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you shouldn't be um, considered as upstream raised, I don't think. Very, very, very interesting discussion. Uh, and I have a, a final question on this because then we can move to something, something slightly different. Uh, Lillian, uh, Lillian was asking, uh, let me see at what time was that, 10.33. She was asking about, uh, about unsaturated soil mechanics because she was suggesting that these structures are different because they are not saturated, they are compact to the extent. Uh, is there a role for uh, unsaturated soil mechanics? Do we need to measure suction? Was uh, her question. Yeah, in my opinion, this is an unsaturated uh, problem, right? We need to incorporate into the design unsaturated uh, approach, right, to understand suction course, a section can generate an additional uh, shear strength, and this needs to be considered in the design as well, right? I think that's really important to engage an expert on a separated uh, behavior to have a good design, right, in my opinion. Okay, okay. Moving to a completely different issue, because I think that these technical issues and the issues related to design have been widely covered by yourselves. Uh, there is a, a question uh, from Lillian at uh, 10.33. What uh, is about instrumentation? What geotechnical instrumentation is recommended during and after dry stacking construction. This is an issue that you guys have not really directly covered, so it would be very interesting to see your views on that. So we would we would look at installing vibrating wire piezometers and making sure that they're calibrated to allow to recording of, of negative um, bore pressures as well as positive. We'd also, we'd also, we'd also put, uh, that, that's in terms of, of these answers, but we'd also include survey monuments as well, just for routine, um, I think that there's no deformations um, as well. I think that we are considering as well as sediment uh, plates on the base, right? Yeah. Uh, to see uh, stresses. And this is a really important uh, measurement as well, right? To, to, to use in this calibration of the models, uh, addition to the 
traditional instrumentation that was mentioned, right? Also to use uh, good uh, topography measurements in terms of to have a good tracking of the material that's being placed. I think that's not a direct instrumentation, but it's an important aspect to have the, the, the tracking of the material and characteristics that's being placed in each of the areas of the, the pile, right, as well. And I think that uh, when you read some some heights, to use uh, INSAR to track in uh, deformation, to track uh, 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 potential movements in some of the areas, better understand it. In clinometers, depending on the characteristics of the foundations, right? I think that's uh, I think that maybe uh, Anna have uh, another additional things based on what we are doing in. In uh, actually, the projects that I I been touch, they usually they always have uh, piezometers, but they 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 have uh, stress plates. Usually, some some designers teams they put some some tensiometers because we want to understand the unsaturated uh, part of the material. That uh, it's is a a big investigation that. Uh, the design teams are, are using in, clima, in, clon, in clinometers and uh, uh, all the topographic uh, uh, measurements that uh, Rafael have, have said. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now moving to a final, a final point. I think that we've been discussing for quite a, quite a little while. There are some questions that are related to construction, actually, to compaction process, what kind of equipment you suggest, uh, what are the typical recommendations for controlling density and water content. Uh, I think that uh, this may, may be related to nuclear measurements as well as conventional measurements. Uh, what are your general recommendations in terms of uh, construction procedures and control methods? I, I can talk a little bit like for, for valleys uh, materials, usually we are using uh, uh, vibratory rollers. We don't use uh, the cheap rollers because uh, our material are sandy like so uh, usually we, 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 we are using uh, flat uh, vibratory rollers. Um, usually we, we buy the heaviest uh, uh, rollers that we, we get, so like 20 tons of capacity. And uh, the, the control, usually we do it like a Brazilian method, call it a uh, hilf. Uh, we have tested then uh, the nuclear densimeter but the problem is that the material changes a lot so uh, the densimeter the, the nuclear densimeter they, they it only gets moisture content and the density so to to get uh, the 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 how uh, to get the the target of the the maximum density you have to do a proctor test so it wasn't very uh useful for us right now to 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 do uh the test uh with nuclear densimeter because the material changes a lot and but we are testing and and maybe we we can uh, get a way to to go around this all this variability and start using um nuclear densimeters uh but usually uh, uh the health method and and proctor tests are the the main uh the main ways that we yeah. we, we control the materials for for moisture content usually we are using uh, uh very quick uh equipment to get the the moisture content but uh some of them we have to be careful about the iron content that may uh change uh how how the, the response in in of moisture content in the in the test 
so some 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 methods we don't use because of iron content okay so we we use a variety of of, of tests depending on on the particular project sometimes we'll we'll use core cutters to take samples and and do triaxial tests on um, we'll do in situ density tests you know, sand replacement something like that um, we'll also do um, the standard index type type testing um, of course one of the, the, the key parameters is the moisture content um, one thing that's worth raising here actually is that often the material is being produced at the process plant at a moisture content that the processors tell us but that's not the same as a geotechnical moisture content and we have to be very very careful to make sure that um, we're talking a geotechnical moisture content not a process engineer's moisture content um, and you know there have been projects like I can see by the look on your faces you've had the same um, <laughs> yeah we have the same <laughs> and usually they, they we, we call uh, from 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 the filtration plant uh, uh, and and, and, and we, we, we have to talk geotechnical, uh, um, technic, geotechnical uh, 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 words. So it's very difficult for us to, 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 to let them, them, them say uh, everything geotechnical uh, yes. uh, matters. <laughs> yeah, so, so we'll be doing our CQA measuring moisture contents um, yeah, using standard um, BS or um, um, or US um, ASTM methods, um, but yeah, sometimes there is a there's a mismatch between what the what the uh, the filter press plant people are telling us. You know, they'll be saying that we're they're using it at 15, 16 percent, and reality it's actually 20 percent as far as geotechnical engineering is concerned. So that's one one thing to um, yeah, as a, as a lesson learned, is to make sure we're, we're all talking the same language in terms of moisture content. So that's the, to us, that's the critical parameter that everything you might have talked out from in terms of a stable dry stack. All the other stuff is really important, but we've got to get the fundamentals right first to make sure that the filter press is producing um, um, uh, filter cake at or below, at or around the, the optimum content. So I just thought I'd add that one in as a, it just <laughs> occurred to me that we need to emphasize that difference. That's quite a statement. Water content is a key parameter in controlling compaction. I hope everybody's listening to you at the moment, okay? <laughs> uh, following, following within these lines, Anna was saying about the variability, and there was a question related to experimental embankments. And the question was, when are they required at the beginning of the design process or continuously through the life cycle to the construction of these structures, considering that the material is changing uh, both from the, the granular distribution and also their mineralogy. So what your recommendations are, having uh, experimental embankments all the way through? Actually, uh we do like our first experimental embankment to understand uh, uh, the the first uh, range of of the material uh, of various on but it's it's important for us to to understand that uh, the process team they usually uh, study the, the the how the 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 grain size distribution mineralogy will vary a long time. So uh, here I have two examples, like for Tabira, we have an old mine and the process team uh, got a study on like on the runoff mine and, and how it will, will be processed. And they got that uh, for 10, 20 years, the, the material will be quite the same. But for Brukutu site, uh, is a new mine and y when you go in in the mine deeper and deeper uh, the material will be finer uh, along years so we have like a five years ten years uh, um, ten years uh, scenery that the, the material will change so first we we do this 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 process study 
to understand uh, how we will, we will, we will, we will get uh, the material changing a long time. And we, we try to, to test it before uh, it happens. Uh, so for Itabir, for Ibrukutu, uh, we, we would have like a 90, 10, um, 90, 10 um, total tailings that represent 10% uh, of, of slimes and ultra fines. And like for three, four years from now, we will have like 80, 20. So we did the test for both. And some structures were designed for one material, and some structures were designed for both. So it it, it the, the the geotechnical parameters were not very different. Only the the way to work on site that was a little bit different because the finer material you have high water content after refrigeration, and usually you have lower compaction uh, water content needed. So uh, we, we, yeah. we, we work this with the process team to understand how it will change. And one structure that is uh, working right now, uh, usually uh, when they see anything is, is changing because we have the, the, some measurements on, on, the, on, the, on the filtration plant, uh, before you go to the stack, we 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 try to understand the material uh, better, and this is happening right now for a structure called it CMD. That uh, the 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 the, pro, the geotechnical responsible for for the pro, for the for the structure um, had one material that is a little bit different. And he contacted us, and we we did a, a quick test only to check if everything was the same. But it will happen all the time. Yeah, just complementing. I think that's a key point, Fernando. Uh, one thing it's the predictable chain, predicted chains, right? Another thing is the unpredicted chains and the process, right? And we need to be aware that a plant, even a filtration plant mining process is not a switzerland wallet uh watch right they, they will not work uh 100 of the time because 100 percent of the time delivering exactly the great size of the design because it it's really important to have this uh what i call it uh, sutral zone well controlled less variable right resilient and when we can deal with the acceptable things in a non-structural zone, right? Of course, this non-structural zone is not just a place of things there. It's just a zone when we can accept different type of material, right? When we can uh, have a less controlled process. Does not mean that we just put the material there and and uh, have a non-controlled or a, total, uh, a waste area, right? No. It's, uh, it's spread, compacted, uh, but can accept a, a different range of the materials that accommodate uh, the reality of the, the process, right? This That's just 100% just... agree, Raphael. That's exactly the, the purpose of the non-structural zone. And it mustn't be viewed kind of like a, a, a tailing stand. It's, it's not that you've got a slurry held behind this, this wall of, of compacted filter tailings. It's, it's just slightly different specification material that is placed there under, in a controlled manner. So completely back up that, that, that point. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Fully agree on that as well. Very interesting uh, answers you have given, very interesting perspective. Uh, if I was wise, I was going to close now but uh, there is a final, a final question from Werner. Uh, this question was sent at 11.55. And since your life has been very easy to now talk about liquefaction, softening, particle breakage, uh, controlling process, Werner has uh, asked uh, the following question. Uh, Tailings are new materials different from conventional materials used for embankment construction. How do the specialists, yourself, see possible changes of properties with time? 
Are there rheological considerations to be taken when looking at these materials? That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know how to reply to that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to reply to that. Um, I, do, I understand what what the, the the gist of the question in that yeah no, the materials we're producing are the product of of recent as in current mechanical breakdown of of the of the original ore um, and so have the particles haven't undergone the the erosion and natural sort of changes that go under a, under a natural material. How that will change in time, I'm not sure that it will. Um, not the actual properties of the material itself, because it, well, it depends what type of time period you're talking about. But we're not talking geological time in terms of like the creation of a of a natural deposit. Um, I think what you can see through time, and we do see through time, just in the time in a lifetime of the facility, as I've said a few times, is that you see that the uh, with consolidation, the uh, um, the, the, the strength of the materials improves significantly over very short periods of time. Um, material properties themselves, I don't see changing over the lifetime of a facility, unless you're talking in perpetuity, in which case, I don't think anybody knows. I, I don't know. I know, Raphael, help me on this one. <laughs> yeah, I think that we answered this, uh, this question during our, our, uh, our webinar here. I think that uh, sometimes it's better to have uh, new materials different from the conventional because when you deal with a conventional, right, we need to have a good carry characterization. Normally, you don't do a, a airfield dam with just a unique material. You need to characterize the material over the time, right? Uh, incorporate this in your design and have your design, uh, your design considering these potential differences on the materials, right? Of course, we need to deal with it, right? We need to, to again, uh, the structural zone when you apply have a less variable material, uh, well controlled at the structural zone, and the non-structural zone, we can deal with this potential change, of course, in a limit, right? We cannot have, for example, I have today 9% uh, of coarse material, 10% of the fine, or I have 50, 50, 50 of fines and 50 of sands. It's a totally different. We need to do a new design or a new, we cannot accept it, right? Uh, and this is not so uh, common, right? As mentioned by Hitcher, uh, we have a line, right? We have a plan that was designed for the, the ore, right? The filter plant was designed by the plant, by the process. And uh, if you, have a big change in the minor in the process, probably you need to change the plant, you need to change your design approach in terms of solutions, technology, in terms of segregation of things. If you have more fines, you can remove a part of fines and have a different destination of the fines, for example, for conventional uh, tailings dam, and keep your project operating like the original design. It's a portion of course and a, a small portion of fines. This is a change management process. We, it's important to be, uh, to say it, this type of design, it's really, really required a good change management process, right? Well-established change management process. I would like to put like some comments. Uh, the tailings, they are uh, crushed rock, so they won't change a lot and for for valleys uh, tailings that i have tested right now uh, they are mostly 80 percent silica so uh, it's it's a material that usually don't change but we we have to test it and see a, a long time if anything happens so uh, just for for getting like it can change but not a lot. We, we don't expect for it to change a lot. Yes, I, I can certainly share your views. Since I'm not the specialist here, I can say anything, so it's easy to <laughs> uh, But yeah, we have some experience on non-plastic materials. They uh, 
they exhibit uh, long-term variations in terms of relaxation and creep. And I would expect this material to show some aging and aging effect in these materials. There's a chance that they will enhance the geomechanical behavior of, of, of these as we see in natural sense. But that's something that remains to be seen. And I think that from my perspective, you've been very consistent on saying that uh, we've got good, good engineering practice, what this engineering practice is, and there are uncertainties that we have to face and to resolve and to tackle throughout uh, the years having more experience. You have said that I'm completely satisfied, and I don't know if you want to make any final remark, any of you, do you have final remarks uh, before closure? Yeah, just from our side here, yeah, thank you, Fernando and uh, colleagues from uh, KP. I think that was a really good discussion for those that are following through the webinar. And as value, we are here to learn, right? To learn from the industry worldwide and also to share what they are doing here, right? And I think that the industry needs to think together, right? It's important uh, change in the mindset in the industry and the industry need to work together. It's value we are here to share and we are here to learn. We need to be humble that this is a starting point, right? We are learning, right? There's a lot of mistakes that will happen. Uh, we need to minimize this uh, working together, the academy working together uh, with a robust process of governance, right? But uh, we are here to learn, right? This is my final uh, remarks. Thank you again. Yeah, no, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of KP as well. Um, I particularly enjoyed um, hearing Anna what Valle are doing and the, particularly the R&D. I'm sure our colleagues both in Brazil and in, in South, uh, South America and the Americas in general uh, are probably well engaged with yourselves. Uh, but I found it personally very, very interesting and enlightening both what both um, Rafael and Anna had to say. So uh, it's been a learning experience for both Martha and I as well in this uh, in this. So that, that's how we that's how we make these things safe is is, is talking, exchanging ideas, listening to the uh, um, the chat on the on the on the screen as well. So there's some really good really good points made. I think we've all learned something from this. So thank you, thank you, for your chat uh, been been very useful. Thank you. I just would like to thank um, for the change, and that's all. Yeah, and thank you from, from me also. It's been a great opportunity to speak about this and it's been a very interesting discussion. Oh, thanks very much to you guys uh, for these very open discussions. I think that you have fulfilled all our expectations and we, we all learned and we all benefited from your experience. But clearly enough, there are best practice in these materials and there is need for research and development, for learning throughout the way, for monitoring these structures, given their size. Uh, this all comes as a full package. So thank you very much for the presentations. I recall that uh, the webinar is going to be available storage in our website. And tomorrow we have another session that with more legislation, more focused on legislation, and the rest of the technical issues. So thank you all, and I see you tomorrow. Okay? Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.